Here at the BBG, the British Business Group Annual Convention, we're reflecting on the Indo-British Partnership, the India-UK Partnership. And I think uh, one company really exemplifies uh, the partnership in a sense, if I can say, Rolls-Royce. Been in India for 80 years now, has 4,000 engines on the ground, has 1,000 engineers here in India and 500 employees. So the Rolls-Royce experience, we're going to take stock of it with Kishore Jairaman, who's president India and South Asia at Rolls-Royce. Kishore, did I get the numbers right? I think you did perfect, Manvi. Okay. Thank you so much. So it's, it's, it's an old relationship with India. But before I examine the evolution of that relationship, let's just take stock of Rolls-Royce's businesses in India. Where are they right, right now? The, the good thing about Rolls-Royce in India is we are able to participate across all our sectors. See, we have aerospace, we have marine, we have energy, we have engines, and nuclear. And across all these sectors, civil aerospace, defense aerospace, we partake in this industry. Nuclear, as it comes up, we'll partake in it. Energy, we're already there in the oil and gas sector, moving forward into the power generation sector. In engines, we have the MTU acquisition, we had the Bergen acquisition before. Both these participate in this country and in South Asia. And I think in marine business, we are working with all the shipyards in India, with the Coast Guard, with Navy. So I think it's a, it's a beautiful opportunity for us in this country to grow as this country grows. But defense still is like the largest piece of, of, of the puzzle. Today, yes. And because what would be next? Uh, next, I think it will be energy and engines. And I, believe it or not, nuclear, if this country decides to go forward with nuclear, we'll have plenty of opportunities in that space. So let's just get that issue out of the way if this country decides to go forward. So, therefore, how are you framing your nuclear business in India? Number one is we needed to have the focus with the right company. So we work with DAE, NPCIL, and all the other stakeholders like LNT, and try to figure out what are our core strengths, what do we bring to the table, what do we need to leverage from this marketplace, so that when the market is ready for it, we are able to partake in it at the most efficient manner. And for that today, we just have a single person on the ground. But we have plans, we say that if this happens, we'll have this many people added. If this happens, we'll have this many people added. It's all milestone based. The reason why we have these milestones is because we don't have clarity on when those milestones will happen, because these are all intergovernmental issues. But you're prepared. But we are prepared for it, yes. Civil aviation. Yes. Gone through uh, turbulence. Yes. Emerging out of it, would you say? And what does that mean for business? Civil aviation in India you know, if you look at the big airlines, it's Air India, it's Jet Airways, uh, now it's Indigo that's flying overseas. Mm. And our participation in the industry was previously with international aero engines. Because when the aircrafts are normally single aisle and uh, double aisle. And the single aisle aircrafts are the, we call it as a narrow bodies, and there the engines are of a particular variety. We were doing that with international aero engines. Mm. But we are out of that now, right? we decided to focus on the white bodies. Hmm. So when we decided to focus on the white bodies, we are on the Airbus 380s, the Boeing 787s, the 777s, the 767, 757. So that series of aircraft is where we participate, the Airbus 350. And uh, I think once we have decided that the focus is going to be there, we have seen success with the Sri Lankan airline campaign recently. Hmm. In India, Air India is still trying to recover from their previous losses, and they are trying to build their whole portfolio again. Hmm. Jet Airways is taking stock of the same stuff. And Indigo is trying to figure out where all they want to fly. But I think as this market evolves, it, my strong belief is that it'll become like China, where you have Shanghai to Beijing on a wide body aircraft. I think India can do Delhi to Chennai on a wide body if there's enough traffic. But that's all based on the economy, that's all based on the growth. And so on the regulate, uh, regulation. And on the regulation, absolutely, yes. So absolutely. what would we pick uh, to change on the regulatory front today? It is something has to happen to create a positive spiral. Hmm. Today what is happening is the fuel costs are high and the taxes are high, and so the cost has to be passed on to the customer, so the customer feels a pain, so the customer doesn't travel so much. So the spiral is not really going up, where it is like your volume of tra you know, travel is not increasing. In spite of all this, I still believe that all these airlines run full. They're still able to make a buck some quarters, right? And, and I think they will figure out a way, and this market will figure out a way where it will be profitable, right? And that point, where it happens, which one comes first, I can't predict. Right? Fair enough. Um, what's keeping you the most busy when it comes to Rolls-Royce in India? <clears throat> well, my job entails 
not only driving the revenues, it's about building capabilities in this country. It's about establishing the strategies over the next 10 years. And um, I think I, I spend about 35% of my time with customers understanding what the market has to be, where do we have to be with our products, and what do we have to do there. I spend about 30% of my time probably between, um, I would say, communicating in the media, communicating in uh, various trade bodies, meeting with ministerial or government organizations, and building a strategy around things. And the rest 30% I spend internally with my people trying to figure out how the organization should be, what should we, we be doing more internally so that we will be prepared for scaling up when the market comes. You haven't accounted for the time that you spend with scientific research outfits, uh, institutions, because that too is an area that you're, you're allocating time and energy to. It was part two of the whole strategy buildup. So mm. I spent time with NAL, DRDO, CSIR, and I Indian Institute of Science, and also figuring out with various, va various people. In fact, it's very interesting when you look at the sectors that we have. For engines, I got to look at a biomass segment, which is like startup entrepreneurs. And then when you look at uh, defense space, you look at DRDOs or other players who are looking at engine you know, co-development. So you look at you know, the, the, the breadth of products that we have and the, and the extent of organizations I have to go to is just uh, fantastic. How many of your you know, peer companies from the United Kingdom feel as comfortable about doing business in India? Oh, you'll have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking because, you know, you must exchange notes. Now, you're, in, in one sense, <coughs> Rolls Royce is a veteran here. And you understand uh, yes. the Indian market. You understand the most complex pockets of the Indian market. Yes. Um, and what I'm tr basically trying yeah. to assess is uh, we sit here, things look bleak, and, you know, we assume that interest in India must have diminished. Yeah. I, on the contrary, I think uh, about UK, right? I worked for a US company before this, and so my interaction has been more on the US side. But when I look at UK, the, the good thing about UK companies is they think long, mm. and they want to set up strategies that will grow businesses in this country for a longer period of time, right? And what that does is it allows them to sit back and view this place from a higher plane. Uh, which is very important for India because in India, with the strong democracy that we are, nothing moves as fast as we want it to move. Indeed. Right? But at the end of the day, by being able to look at this whole big, broad picture, um, I do believe a lot of the UK companies do a lot of right things in this country. But I don't think they communicate enough about all the good things they do. And I don't think they leverage the benefits of all the good things that they do. And I think there's definitely room to do more in all angles. For instance, manufacturing locally, mm. and you have experience of that. Mm. You know, again, a perception is, would be tough. Mm. What's your Rolls Royce experience manufacturing locally been? Well, there are some benefits to being in this country for 80 plus years, <laughs> <laughs> right? So we formed a partnership with HAL back in 1956, as you know. And we've had a very successful partnership with them with technology transfer on the engines. And as we moved through um, the whole timeline, the next phase of the evolution was a joint venture, which we formed in 2010 with them. Hmm. Okay? And it took us about a year because it was the beginning of a new phase of all our lives. So there was a little bit of initial you know, things that we had to sort out. But as soon as it was done, within 12 months, we went from a greenfield site to putting a component out for testing. And within about 15 months, we had production pouch, right? So for people who say that it cannot be done in India, I think it is about getting the right companies to work together. In some cases, in cases like ours, I think it's very important to form those key partnerships. When we have those partnerships, the partners understand each other, the board is committed to growing the company, both companies want to grow it. I think the result is what we have in Bangalore. Reassuring words, I'm sure, to those listening. Kishore Jairaman, thank you very much for your insights and your time. Pleasure talking to you. Pleasure was all mine, Manvi. Thank you very much.